Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Breaking the Code, Women in Data, hosted by Synthesis in partnership with Girl Code. My name is Dineko Simbina, and I'll be your host for today. So, are you a female currently studying towards an IT qualification? Do you have a passion for data? Or are you simply looking to start your data journey? If you have answered yes to any of these questions, then you're at the right place. Especially since we know that women are the key to scaling, up, to scaling up artificial intelligence and data science. And yet women continue to be neglected on multiple fronts, especially that of the new workforce. Society as a whole should ensure that all females are, giving, are given equal opportunities to grow in this new age workforce. And we must understand that all of us have a stake in this mission. Women are the key piece to the puzzle of realizing the highest maturity levels of digital enterprises. And in order to close the gender gap in science, technology, engineering, and math, and to accelerate advances in artificial intelligence and the sciences, we must encourage and support women on all levels and establish equal employment opportunities for all. Data science and artificial intelligence are fields in which women are vastly underrepresented, and the numbers make it clear. Females compose of just 28% of the science and engineering workforce, and that number drops when observing the number of women pursuing university degrees in these fields. And only about 55% of university graduates are females, but only a little over a third of those degrees are actually in STEM. For example, research from the World Economic Forum shows that only 3% of females take coursework for information communication technology, and with just 5% choosing to pursue studies in maths as well as statistics. As you can see from the stats that I have just mentioned, there is a clear shortage of female representation in various fields within STEM, namely data science and artificial intelligence. Hence the purpose of this webinar. In celebration of Youth Month, Girl Code in partnership with Synthesis Technologies want to give you a better understanding of what is out there for you, especially being a student and wanting to pursue a career in AI or data science. We have a great panel of experts who will be sharing some insightful information that will help to guide you towards starting your data career. And with Girl Code being an organization that is aimed at empowering young girls and women through technology, the partnership with Synthesis Technologies may, made even more sense. And Synthesis Technologies is a digital company that focuses on employment equity. And at Girl Code, we aim to alleviate the current rise in unemployment through targeted skills and job placement initiatives for young girls and women. Some of our initiatives include our Girl Coder Club. This program focuses on teaching primary and high school girls all over South Africa coding and robotic skills. We also host a series of workshops that are focused on teaching coding skills to unemployed women and post-metric college or varsity female students. At Girl Code, we believe that the more women get involved with tech, design, as well as development, the more successful and diverse companies and their products will be in the future. With the world rapidly changing and our education system not being able to keep up, organizations like Girl Code are needed now more than ever. The reality is that universities are behind in terms of the curriculum offering for comprehensive programming skills. We need to be able to equip future job seekers with the necessary skills to be able to fully participate in the economy and take advantage of the rising opportunities in the tech space. Education and skill acquisition are important determinants of job and income prospects. And demand for talent with technical skills has grown exponentially. However, companies are still struggling to find qualified workers with programming skills, especially female talent. And the increasing demand for workers who can write code is opening up job opportunities at a far faster rate than what the universities can supply. 
Young people need to be equipped with the necessary skills to meet the labor market demands. With that being said, I would like to run through today's agenda. Our speakers will begin, pre begin presenting from quarter past four right up to quarter past five. And from quarter past five to quarter to six, we will be opening up our Q&A session. With that being said, kickstarting today's session, we have Girl Code Chairwoman and CEO, Zandile Mkwanazi. She is a recipient of the 50 Most Inspiring Women in ICT 2018 Award. And in the same year, she was awarded a Social Entrepreneurship Award by the Premier of Gauteng, David Makura. Zandile is also a valued keynote speaker, having shared the stage at the Standard Bank Women in Technology Conference, the, Women in, the Africa Women in Tech Conference, and the South African STEM Conference. And her topic today speaks about how the future is female. Welcome, Zandile. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for this opportunity. So when I was 23 years old, I realized something very important, which is that women are not being represented in spaces that are designed and creating, spaces that are designing and creating the products and innovations that are shaping our future. So I decided to do something about it. I had a hypothesis. And my hypothesis was that there are, in fact, many women that are interested in technology and are interested in being in these spaces. They just don't have the platform and opportunities to do so. And so that was the birth of Girl Code, a nonprofit organization aimed at empowering young girls and women through technology. However, over the years, interacting with different women, I started to notice something. Many women were not taking up opportunities created for them. And not because they don't want to, but because they did not believe that they had the skills, both technical and soft skills needed to thrive in their chosen career paths. So over the past couple of years, we've been hearing the saying, the future is female, the future is female. And today I really want to unpack what at least I believe the saying means. So the world is changing at a very rapid pace. And with technologies, some jobs are changing faster than ever. According to the latest research, soon we'll only be as good as the skills that we possess. The World Economic Forum has provided a list of skill sets that would be needed to excel in today's economy. From creative thinking, to creativity, people management, coordinating, service orientation, and negotiation skills. I believe that as women, we inherently possess all these skills in our everyday lives and need to harness them into our work life. You have the best chance of success if you get these skills and continuously improve on them. Now I want us to explore how as women we've been utilizing these skills in different aspects of our lives and how we can utilize them in the four hour space. Complex problem solving. Complex problem solving is concerned with applying logic and using imagination to devise intelligent solutions to problems. So the picture on the right demonstrates Umlebe farming organics, a project started by Nontlatla in the rural areas of KZN. In 2014, Nontlatla was out of work and diagnosed with cancer. She quickly realized that she has to come up with creative ways in order to put food on the table for herself and her family. So having little arable land, what she started doing is growing vegetables inside these plastic bags in her backyard. And because she didn't have enough arable land, she had to be creative. She had to think about this, crop, this complex problem of agriculture and figure out how to provide solutions. Now she can feed herself and she sells some of her produce to her community. So the ability to take complex problem systems and break them down into their simplest form and figure out how to provide solutions is a critical skill in the tech space. And agri-tech is one of those sectors that are, increasingly that are increasing 
and we'll need many people to be part of it, especially women. Another skill set is creativity. Now, creativity is thinking. Creative thinking involves generating original ideas and unique ways of solving problems. Now, before you dismiss yourself as a non-creative, like myself, I like to say that I'm not a creative person. Remember that creativity is not exclusive to the art field, arts and culture. As the World Economic Forum senior writer Alex Gray said, with the avalanche of new products, new technologies, and new ways of working, employees are going to have to be more creative than ever in order to benefit from these changes. Robots might help us get to where we want to, but they can't be as creative as humans, at least not yet. And I thought a great example of creativity is one of Tato, the founder of Repurpose School Bags, which basically uses recycled plastic bags and cardboards and has a solar panel that allows them to be charged um, during the day when the kids go to school and basically use that at night to be able to study where there's no electricity. Another skill set that needed is coordinating with others. Coordinating with others involves strong communication skills and awareness of other people's strengths and weaknesses and being able to work with a range of different personalities. Love it or hate it, we all have family gatherings, parties, baby showers, all these things that we've been forced to be part of the planning committee of. And this is just another example why I believe that women innately have these skill sets that are needed in the technology space. Now, part of being in the workspace in the workplace means that you're going to interact with different people, different personalities from different cultures and backgrounds. And being able to assign roles to different people based on those skill sets and personalities is a critical skill. Being able to work effectively and efficiently with other people is something that is needed in the world of today and tomorrow. And again, this is a skill that I think women innately have within them. We've always been there planning events. And like I said, whether you love it or not, it's part of who we are. We never hardly ever assign men to plan any parties. So collaboration is crucial in any work environment. And this is something that thankfully humans, again, are so better at than robots. Service orientation. The ability to actively look for ways to help people, having strong service orientation skills is all about shining a spotlight on others and anticipating what they need will be in the future. For me, that sounds like describing a mother. And recently becoming a mother of myself, I constantly think about my baby's needs and not just his needs for now, but his needs for the future, 10 years, 20 years from now. And this is a demonstration of the kind of skill sets that we have in our personal space that we don't necessarily think would be useful in the workplace. In the workplace. A, good, a good example of this is as a mother, I constantly have to plan my child's day. I have to anticipate his needs and I have to be proactive. A good example again is at night, I know that 1 a.m. he wakes up, he needs milk, he wakes up again at 3 a.m. and again at 5 a.m. Now, all of these are data points that you're collecting without even realizing it. So it's information that's being stored subconsciously. And all I've done is proactively preparing his milk so that by the time he wakes up, it's already ready before he can cry. So you wouldn't necessarily associate being a mother as a critical skill that you would need in four hour, but this is one of the most sought after skills that are currently needed in every company. Getting a grip on service orientation involves stepping into the minds of not just your clients, but your consumers and thinking about what they value, what they fear and dislike and developing new products or adapting services to future proof the company. Lastly, negotiation skills. Negotiation is a method by which people settle differences. It is a process by which compromise or agreement is reached while avoiding arguments and disputes. So in 2018, I traveled to Thailand 
And on the first day, we decided to go to the flea market and get some some clothes and some some stuff for the family. Now, I paid the price that was offered because I was too scared to negotiate. So I just accepted whatever the sales person said the price was. was. And later on, when I went to a different flea market, I discovered that the prices were cheaper. Now, a good lesson is, yes, we can be scared sometimes. We can be scared to negotiate, whether we're negotiating our salaries or negotiating our working conditions. But one thing to take from that is that whilst you might be scared to do something, it's an opportunity to also learn and improve on those skill sets. So last year when I went to Bali with my family, I negotiated every single price to a price that I was comfortable paying. So I'm just going to share with you some tips on how you can improve some of these skills. And these are basically five tips on how to effectively find the natural skill sets. First thing is to learn from others. A lot of us believe that we have to know it all. We have to be the one that discovers how to do something new. But that's not true. There are a lot of people that have paved the way. There are a lot of people that have written books, done seminars and webinars and TED talks. And you need to adopt the mindset of learning from them. This is another critical way of making sure that even though you don't have the above skills mentioned or you're not as good as some, learning from others ensures that you continuously improve yourself. Tip number two is keeping record of your progress. Learning a new skill set or improving skill sets is a difficult task and takes a lot of work. It's a continuous pro progress and you never actually get to the end of it. So the next steps after you've started learning from other people is to set goals for yourself. Write down smart goals of what you want to achieve and when you want to achieve them. And keep progress of your record and keep record of your progress. A good example of this is maybe you're not so good at negotiation skills. A good goal to set would be I want to become very good at negotiation skills so that by the next quarter when I speak to my manager about salary increases, I can propose an increase from Y to Z. Now and then you need to figure out what it is that you need to do in order to be good at negotiation. What seminars you need to watch, what else you need to read, and basically continuously improving yourself and make sure that by the time your deadline comes, you really improve the your negotiation skills and hopefully you can get the salary increase. Once you have your goals and the skills that you need, you need to then practice. Practice, practice. And when you're done practicing, practice some more. Another key thing is you need to take up opportunities. I can't say this enough times. There are so many opportunities out there from organizations such as ourselves and other ones that are similar. You have to be the first one to raise up your hand when opportunities present themselves. And if, even if they don't present themselves, you have to be the one to open up opportunities for yourself. And I think a lot of us take this for granted, especially in the workplace. There's a lot of small things that you can do that will start opening up opportunities for yourself, especially if you want to excel in your career and quickly climb up that ladder. When you have board meetings, volunteer to be the one that presents to the team. When you have team building events, volunteer to be part of the team. And build up your skills on coordinating and working with other people that are not necessarily in the team that you've been placed in. So again, I really encourage you to take up every single opportunity that's out there and always be on the lookout for them. The last tip is you definitely need to get feedback. And I know from experience, getting feedback is not always the greatest thing. But this is very critical if you need if you're going to improve your skill sets. Firstly, you need to know whether you are improving or not, and feedback can help you do that. You need to carefully select the people that you ask feedback from. So not everybody is going to give you constructive feedback, not everybody is going to give you nice feedback. And so it's up to you to really filter out all that information that you get and figure out what works for you and what doesn't. And feedback is not only from just your manager when you have your quarterly reviews. 
get feedback from your teammates. Ask them how you're improving. Ask them how your different skill sets are not doing and how you can improve um, if it's still not doing well. Get feedback from your family and your friends. You don't have to always practice at work. At home, use opportunities to present to the different family members and friends and ask them how you're doing. Use opportunities for negotiation skills. Like I mentioned, going into different markets and seeing how you can negotiate the prices. Any feedback is not always easy and will require you to have a thick skin. But take everything with a pinch of salt and you don't, like I said, have to listen to everyone's feedback. I hope that this information has really been helpful in identifying some of the skills that I believe women innately have within them that you might not necessarily have thought about it in that way. But I've realized that in fact, you might actually have those skills and you might be using them in your everyday life. You just haven't transitioned into using them into your work life. And also I hope that the tips will help you to improve the skills you need to succeed in the fourth industrial revolution. Thank you. Thank you very much, Zandile, for shedding some light on those important soft skills that we sometimes take for granted. Coming up next, we have Almarie Grant. Almarie heads up the Synthesis Academy. She loves science, tech, and good stories in equal measure, and will be speaking about defining the various disciplines within AI, ML, data science, and data engineering, as well as what competencies are required for each respective discipline. Welcome, Almarie. Hi everyone, good afternoon. Um, thank you for that lovely introduction, Tanika. Um, I always, always love working with Girl Code. It's such an exciting um, project and initiative, and it's wonderful to know that we are inviting new women into the workplace and into this incredibly important um, piece of, um, of data. One of my favorite things to do um, is to speak to small children and to ask them what they want to be when they grow up. And inevitably they say, I want to be a ballerina or I want to be a soccer player or more recently, I want to be a TikTok star. Um, and when I say why, they always say, because it looks cool and interesting. But what they never say when I ask them what they want to be when they grow up is I want to be a data scientist. And I really hope that by unpacking some of the um, fascinating facts about this dark art data science and like really cracking the code for people, we will encourage young women to increasingly look at this as a real career opportunity. So I've called my slide deck today the dark art that's turning into bread and butter. And the reason for that, quite simply, is that in the past, as a business, all you really needed to do was have a good product or service, and you needed to sell that on to your customers. And then you could make money. A little while later, we realized that if we understood a little bit more about our customers and we took our message out to them, they would buy more of our product. And that's how marketing was born and a whole discipline around that. Even further on down the line, we realized that in this process of selling our products and services and figuring out who our customers are, we actually hold a great amount of data about them. And if we're really clever, we can unpack some of this data to make us even more successful in the businesses that we run. In a world where our customers are increasingly demanding personalized and just-in-time products and services, trying to stay ahead of them is really difficult. But we have all this information, this dark art of data, that if we use it properly, can actually turn into our bread and butter and can actually make us more successful, more profitable, and more memorable to our clients. So how do we make more money from our customers? And how do we use data science to help us do this? Well, the very, very first thing we need to do is meet our customers' needs. This seems like a perfect no-brainer, right? But the trick here is to often to do it before the customer even knows that they have this need. One of the great examples of this um, is a brand like Uber Eats, right? When you think you're hungry and you go onto the app 
they absolutely create your hunger for you with all these amazing pictures of the fantastic food. Not just that, they remember where you last ordered, they can tell you what you last ordered, and they can tell you how far away your order is so that you can really manage your hunger. So meeting those customer needs based on the data that they already hold is one of the ways that this particular brand is successful. Another way to make more money off of our customers is to predict their behavior. Where are they going to be? When are they going to need my service, my product? How can I make sure that I'm there when they need me and as they need me? Here's a really cool story that happened to me um, personally. So I used to live in the UK and I decided to move house. And as I moved into my new property, the very, very first piece of mail I got was from this company called B&Q. B&Q is a little bit like a, um, an amalgamation between Mr. Price Home um, and Bill's Warehouse. They sell all sorts of fant fantastic DIY products and soft furnishings. And the mail that I got um, through my letterbox that morning was an offer for new curtains and new lamps at a discount from B&Q. Now, how on earth did B&Q knew that I had just moved into my new home? And how did they deliver the very, very first piece of mail that I got there with this amazing offer? Because trust me, I needed the new curtains and the new lamps, obviously. What they had done is they had gone into a partnership with the Royal Mail. And at the time, you were able to go to the Royal Mail and say, please, would you forward all my mail from my old property address to my new property address? And B&Q saw the opportunity that this data would have for them. Bought the data off Royal Mail, and all they really needed was my new address and when I would move in, so which date my new mail had to be sent onto the new property. And they could tie into that and deliver me an incredibly personalized service. So predict my behavior. But often we also want to be able to predict behavior that is not so pleasant. So if I'm the kind of business that um, is extending credit to customers, I want to know if there's any kind of prediction that can tell me whether they're not likely to honor their debt. So what data do I already have? What information of their past behavior can I use and analyze and put a model on to predict how they are likely to behave in the future. And that will make it much easier for me to build um, a particular product or offering for them. Another brand that is really good at predicting our behavior is this one. Have you ever Googled something like new car and the next minute the um, advertisement that pops up is for car insurance? Again, Google spends their lives building the most incredible algorithms to try and look at our past behavior all the information that we've given them through our search history and then predict what our next step is going to be so that they can give us the best possible search result for what we might possibly look for. The next way that data science helps us to make more money off our customers is by creating loyalty. And we can do this in two ways. The first one is by creating brand recognition. And the idea behind this is that when I need a product or a service, one brand will immediately pop up and be top of mind for me. If I were to say to you, what is your favorite hair styling brand? Chances are you're going to come up with this one, GHD, Good Hair Days, right? That is brand recognition. GHD has built an incredible brand on the premise that you must think of them first and they will saturate the market with their messaging so that they can create this brand recognition. The second way to create loyalty is to drive behavior and create habit. And one set of um, companies that do this really well is your favorite coffee shop. Most of our coffee shops now have a little loyalty card and you either get a sticker or a stamp every time you get your favorite cappuccino in the morning um, and your 10th cup is free. But really all they are doing is driving behavior so that when you're driving to work in the morning, or when you get up or whenever your particular habit is and you get that cup of coffee, you get into the habit of doing so. And if we can create those habits, then they can predict when you will be there and how they can sell you more and better services. It makes it much easier for them to reach you with their product when they can predict your behavior. One of the important things about data science is that it 
constantly challenges our assumptions about what we think the metrics are for these um, three elements. Do we really know, and is the metric that we are using today still valid tomorrow to continue um, making us profitable? One of the key metrics that we sometimes use is something called recency, frequency, and value. Recency, when last did you buy from me? Was it yesterday or was it five years ago? Because the more recent your interaction with me, the more likely that you will come back. Provided obviously it was a good interaction. Frequency, how often do you come back? This example of the coffee shop, do you come back every single day? And how can we determine how we can make that um, an extended engagement? The next one is value. How much money do you spend with me? Because the more money you spend with me, the more engaged you are with my brand or my product, and therefore you are a more, more loyal customer. But is this really the only metric we can use to check how loyal people are to our brand? And here's a very interesting case study and your fun fact for the day. About five years ago, one of the biggest brand agencies in the world decided to test this um, hypothesis that recency, frequency, and value are the measures we can use to figure out whether people are loyal. They did a whole bunch of, bunch of research and used all the data at their um, fingertips. And they realized that, in fact, it wasn't. That there was one other very specific measure that they could use to understand what the most um, valued brand in the entire universe was. And this one is going to surprise you. The measurement they used was whether a customer would be willing to take this particular brand's logo and have it tattooed on themselves. Now, if you think of GHD, ladies, chances are you are not going to have that tattooed on yourself. So it's a real measure of long-term loyalty if you're willing to do this. Do you have any idea what this brand is? Any idea whatsoever? That's the one, Harley Davidson Motorcycles. A really great way where data science has helped us understand a measurement that previously we'd not we would not have had. So the role of data science in business is really clear. For companies to be successful, they really need to understand who we are, how we interact with them, how often we, we buy from them, um, and why we do so. They have to collect all of that data. They have to analyze it. They have to store it. Sometimes they have to clean it a little bit. And um, they also have to decide what to do with it. Because it's not just about giving you something right here, right now. It's about your entire life cycle as a customer. You might start with them as a single person, but you might end up in a completely different life stage. And how can they predict when that next life stage is kicking in and then offer you a service or a product that absolutely meets your need? How do they wade through all of this different data and decide what is important? How do they translate all those insights into real business insight and ultimately into um, being profitable? And of course, it's not just customer data where this becomes important. We're also talking about the data about our own products. When do they sell best? Is there a particular volume that is most popular? Um, is it about a particular kind of product that is actually most profitable for us, but that we don't sell very much of? How can that data help us to be better at what we do? We can look at the skill sets within our own companies and say, well, what does the data there tell me? And how can we use data science to improve the skills that we have and build a better business? How can we look at our supply chains or at the agreements that we have with our providers to really provide a much better service? And that's where data science becomes really interesting because all of the um, soft skills that Zandile mentioned earlier on, this creativity that we need, are all the things that will really make us successful in the space of data. But ultimately, we don't just want to sit there and crunch numbers. We also want to put automated models on top of that so that our data can work for us rather than us having to work harder. And this, of course, is where the roles in data science came, come in. In order for us to do anything with, with this data, we have to have people who really understand what to do with it, who understands 
how to look after it and how to implement it and how to look at it differently, how to negotiate with that data to decide what's important and what not. At Synthesis, we've identified four specific roles that we think are quite nicely delineated in the way that they set out how people in an organization may interact with this data. And when I show it to you, it might seem like it's a clear process, but it really isn't. It really is this collaboration of all four of these things that help us to work together to create something new. In some organizations, one person will fulfill all of these roles. In some organizations, multiple people will perform different portions of each role. And so it will differ tremendously depending on where you go. But in general, we think that these four roles are the ones that really have unique skill sets and have a unique interaction with the data that they service. The first one is the data engineer. Now, sometimes we call them database, database administrators or database architects, and they are all about storing and managing the information that we get in from our various data sources. How do we make sure that we get it and we keep it safe? How do we make sure that when we get it, we put it in a, in a format and in a shape so that we can extract it again quickly? Are we giving the right things the right names? Are we making sure that we are not duplicating information across different fields? How do we make sure that we maintain this? How do we deal with duplicate sets? How do we clean this data to make sure that it stays fresh and up to date and relevant so that it's absolutely ready when we need it? To use Zandile's um, example earlier of, of parenting, um, this is the person who goes and buys the nappies and makes sure that it's there just in case you need it and organizes it and organizes the summer clothes and the winter clothes and all the bottles and the dummies and all the toys in alphabetical order. That is typically what your data engineer will do. Your data analyst is the next person. They are the guys who take all of this information and really distill it into business insights and go, hang on, this is what this data actually means. Very often, that's mom when baby cries and goes, ah, that's cry number two. That's the hungry cry. And that's what we need to deal with this. These are the people that take in that information and do something with it. With it. They typically are the people who also help bridge the gap between the hardcore data science and the more IT-related stuff and the actual business and really proves the value of data science within the organization. Our next role is that of our classic data scientist. We sometimes call them data managers or statisticians, and they really are the guys who say, let's think about different data sets and how they may correlate back to each other and whether we can extract insights from that. So do we have a sense of when baby cries, how often it is because they're hungry or how often it is because they're cold or how often it is because they need a quick nappy change? And if we have a sense of what that looks like and maybe some of the times that that happened, we may be able to preempt this and actually take the pain out of the process. And so people like this typically um, really enjoy the mathematics and playing around with different data sets and trying to find correlations and causes between all of these different um, pieces of information. The last role that we've identified is that of machine learning engineer. And this machine learning engineer is really the person that takes all of these other bits and pieces and say, how can we write an algorithm that can give us what we need? And how can we continue to test this? We um, sometimes call them application developers because that's very often what a machine learning engineer will do. They will have to go and write a new piece of code to try and extract all of this, to try and build a new algorithm, and then to give us a piece of information that can ultimately be the nugget that will make us more successful or not. What's really nice about these roles is if you look at these other names that we call these roles, it means that you don't need to walk out of university or school and have the word data engineer behind your name. If you do work around database administration, chances are it's very easy for you to migrate into a pure data science engineering role. Similarly with um, our data analysts, if you have strong business analysis background and you've got strong analytic skill in that space, chances are it's very easy for you to make the jump into the data science and data analyst um, portion of the world. 
So don't just think of these think of these things as very singular roles that you have to fulfill. A number of other skills come into play into building these particular roles. For me, it's always really important when I speak to people about entering the workplace and picking a career is to say, what is it that you really enjoy doing? What is the stuff that makes you want to get up in the morning and that really excites you? And so what we've done when we put together the little cheat sheet, which we will send you after the session, is to say, if you enjoy software architecture or data storage, then you might be a data engineer. But if you're all about the programming and the systems design, well, maybe machine learning is the way for you to go. And so we really want you to think a little bit about not just one particular area, but all these different skill sets that work together. And you may very well find that you start off as one thing and migrate through the work that you do into something else. That's absolutely fine. Because remember, I said these are collaborative um, and iterative professions that all work together. And you might very well start in one place and end up somewhere else because that's where your skill set takes you. I'm not going to talk too much about skill sets because Deborah, who's um, speaking a little bit later on, will talk you through the specific technical skills that you may need for each of these roles and some of the things that you can do to build those particular skill sets. We will also send you that cheat sheet that will have all of this information on it so that you can take it away and go and play with it a little bit until you decide what you really want to do. For me, what I really wanted to do today is give you a little bit of an insight into why data science is cool. I would love to walk into a room and ask a little girl, what do you want to be when you grow up? And have her say, a machine learning engineer, because they do cool stuff. And if I've done that, then I think I would have done my job. So thank you very much for your participation, for sharing this session with me, and I wish you all the best in your career going forward. Thank you for breaking down data science for us, Elmarie and using everyday examples in doing so, as well as the various roles in data science. Coming up next, we have Deborah Swartz, who is a talent acquisition specialist at Synthesis Technologies, and she will be telling us more about the tech skills which are required in order to be more successful in the above mentioned disciplines. Welcome, Deborah. Thank you so much, Tanico. Thank you, ladies, for having us. So today we are going to be talking Let's Talk Toolkits um, and, the sticks and the tech stacks required um, for pioneering data technologists. So essentially we'll be talking about the tools needed for data engineering, data analysis, data science and machine learning. First and foremost, a tech stack is defined as a set of technologies an organization uses to build an application or perform a function related to, for purposes of today's discussion, the realm of data. So let's explore the tech stacks involved namely in the previously defined disciplines, data engineering, data analysis, data science, and machine learning. SQL and Python are languages which remain consistently utilized throughout the various disciplines in data engineering, data analysis, data science, and machine learning. Therefore, should your passion lie with any of the aforementioned specialities, SQL and Python are tools you should endeavor to become proficient in. SQL is a domain-specific language used in programming and designed for managing data held in relational database management systems or for stream processing in a relational data stream management system. Python is an interpreted high-level general-purpose programming language. Python is one of the most powerful yet easy-to-read programming languages around. Fun fact, Python is cross-platform. Almost anyone can use it, no matter what computer operating system you have. You can run pretty much um, any Python program on Windows, Mac, and Linux, uh, personal computers, and from large servers through to tiny little computers such as the Raspberry Pi. You can even run Python programs on Android and iOS tablets. So let's talk data engineering. Data engineers, as Elmarie has specified, are the data professionals who prepare the big data infrastructure to be analyzed by data scientists. They are software engineers who design, build, integrate data from various resources and, manages big, and manage big data. So you may be asking, what tools or background do I need? So data engineers typically have a degree in maths or science. The expertise gained from this kind of foundation allows you to use programming languages to mine and query data, and in some cases use big, um, big data SQL engines. Companies hiring for data engineer roles will require the following competencies. 
knowledge of SQL and Python, experience with cloud platform, in particular AWS. And for purposes of our discussion today, Synthesis is an AWS consulting partner and therefore our preferred choice of tool. Knowledge of Java or um, Scala, as well as a good understanding of SQL and no SQL databases. These are databases designed for data modeling and data warehousing. In addition to the aforementioned Amazon Redshift, um, Amazon SageMaker, AWS well-architected framework. On a side note, it's important to remember that creating a software system is a lot like constructing a building. If the foundation is not solid, structural problems can undermine the integrity and function of the building. The AWS well-architected framework helps cloud architects build the most secure, high-performing, resilient, and efficient infrastructure possible for their applications. Data architecture for machine learning is another competency. And just to remember that in machine learning, data is both the teacher and the trainer that shapes the algorithm in a specific way. Let's now talk data analysis. Put very simply, data analysts translate numbers into plain English. Every business collects data, whether it's sales figures, market research, logistics, or transportation costs. A data analyst's job is to take that data and use it to assist companies in making better and more educated business decisions to reach their commercial objectives. What education and or tools do you need? A high level of mathematical ability, programming languages again, such as SQL and Python, Amazon Redshift, Amazon S AWS S3, AWS Glue, AWS Athena, um, and statistics and data vis uh, visualization, the graphic representation of data. In addition to that, um, you'll need a good familiarity with Microsoft Excel, SQL, and SAS, which is a statistical software suite developed for data management and advanced analytics. Let's talk data science. Data scientists frequently work alongside business stakeholders to better understand their goals and determine how data can be used to achieve those goals. They design data modeling processes, create algorithms and predictive models to extract the data and business needs, and then help the data and help analyze the data and share these insights. What education and what tools do you need? A very strong educational background is usually required to develop the depth of knowledge necessary to be a data scientist. Earn a bachelor's degree in IT, computer science, mathematics, or physics. In order to qualify further, a master's degree in data or related field will prove to be highly beneficial. Beneficial. The tools you will require will be SQL, Python, Amazon Redshift, Amazon SageMaker, statistics and linear algebra, and machine learning methodologies. Finally, let's talk machine learning. An elementary explanation of machine learning can be described as technologists trying to teach machines to learn from experience. What education and what tools do you need? Generally, machine learning engineers must be skilled in computer science and programming, mathematics and statistics, as well as data science. The tools, once again, SQL and Python, along with Amazon Redshift, Amazon SageMaker, machine learning frameworks and tools, modern ETL computer and orchestration frameworks, such as Apache Spark, Apache Flink, Apache Kafka, etc. For the longest time, data science was often performed in silos, using large machines with copies of production data. This process was not easily repeatable, explainable, or scalable, and often introduced business and security risk. With modern enterprises now adopting a DevOps engineering culture across the application stack, no longer can machine learning development practices operate in isolation from the rest of the dev teams. This has resulted in machine learning engineers needing to understand and fully appreciate the practice and fundamentals of DevOps. Very simply put, DevOps is a delivery process. Usually, a DevOps engineer doesn't code, but concentrates on the delivery of software that's been built by developers. In taking this to account, machine learning engineers will additionally need to be proficient in containerization technologies, such as Docker and Kubernetes. For purposes of this very high-level discussion, a container is a unit of software that packages up code so that the application runs quickly and reliably from one computing environment to another. Along with containerization technologies, um, infrastructure tools such as Kubernetes, SageMaker, Airflow, Hadoop, Docker, these are tools designed to make it easier to create, deploy, and run applications by using containers. In addition to the major technology sets discussed previously, the following sets may also be applicable. 
I am told that this table will be made available to all members of our audience today as a takeaway from today's session and for ease of reference. Today I'm taking the liberty of addressing um, the discussion regarding CVs. So I know that it is quite a daunting experience to have to type up a CV from scratch. So I decided to give our audience a couple of tips. First and foremost is length. Ensure your CV is no more than two pages long. Choose a clear, legible font and stick to a couple of uh, stick, stick to a couple of font sizes throughout. The body of your CV should be no smaller than size 11 font. Layout. Put your name at the top and make it larger, centralized, and bold. Next should come your email address, contact number, and residential address. Personal statement. Write a brief personal statement directly under your contact details. This should cover who you are, what you can bring to the table, and your career aims. Rather than reeling off about your hobbies or interests, use this section to tell your employer why you're a good fit for their organization. Education. Include qualification, subject, grade, institution, and year in which you achieved this. Employment history. List your most recent role first, and in terms of layout, include your job title, company of employment, and the dates of your tenure. Include any key points that may resonate with the, the prospective employer. It is advisable to ensure that you list your reasons for leaving, so as to mitigate against anyone ruling you out for perhaps your CV looking a little bit jumpy. Did you know, on average, recruiters spend just 75 seconds reading your CV? This, this means that you have just over a minute to sell yourself and your strengths to the reader. Three quarters of CVs are rejected due to bad grammar, spelling, or poor visual layouts. Ensure that you tailor your CV to each individual job you apply for. Identify skills in the job spec and include examples of these. Make each version of your CV a clear reflection of you as a perfect candidate for this job. Aside from qualifications, help yourself stand out from the crowd by listing any additional skills or other information that will strengthen your application. This could include training, language, skills, relevant awards, or membership of professional bodies. Read through your CV before you press send and ask someone else to double check it in case any spelling or grammatical errors have slipped through the net. Let's talk interview tips. First and foremost, research the industry and the company so as to engage meaningfully with the panel. Make the most of the tell me about yourself question, always an awkward question and always one that remains very difficult to answer. Don't be shy to talk about accolades that are both relevant and irrelevant to the role at hand. For example, climbing, Kilimanja uh, Kilima climbing Mount Kilimanjaro demonstrates tenacity and determination. Clarify your selling points and the reasons you want the job. Anticipate the interviewer's concerns and reservations. Interviewers look, look for ways to screen people out. Put yourself in their shoes and ask yourself why they might, may not want to hire you. What are you lacking? And prepare your defense against this. Prepare for common interview questions. Yes, you will be asked where do you see yourself in five years' time and why the company should be hiring you. Line up your questions for the interviewer. This shows a vested interest and demonstrates your knowledge of the company as well as your serious intent. Be ready for behavior-based questions. Prepare to answer questions based on a live example of a situation you've previously encountered and be prepared to explain how you overcame that particular scenario. Dress appropriately. A modest outfit which depicts professionalism is always advisable. Be ready for technical questions which will require you to solution often on a whiteboard or similar platform during the interview. Always remember that your ability to reach the desired solution is less important than the, step, the steps you take in which to get there. Lastly, try to con convince yourself that rather than it being an interview, it is merely a meeting between like-minded individuals. This will calm your nerves and assist you in putting forward true authenticity and interacting in a conversational manner. Thank you for taking the time to, to join today. I'd like to end off on a quote that really did resonate with me. This is from Ginny Rometty, CEO and chairwoman of IBM, who says, I learned to always take on things I've never done before. Growth and comfort do not coexist. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. What is required from an HR perspective? 
and to our viewers. Just a reminder to please post your questions in the Q&A tab, just so that we can have our experts assist in this regard. Last but not least, we will be joined by Archie Ockrell, who is a machine learning engineer, and her current focus is on artificial intelligence, AI education, and is responsibly getting AI systems into production. She's recognized for her AI expertise, and she will be sharing her life and experience as a machine learning engineer. Welcome, Archie. Thanks, Tanika. Thanks for the introduction. So actually something, I haven't prepared a presentation, I just thought I'd speak through my life experience. And something that resonated me with uh, earlier when Zandila was speaking was with regards to service orientation. The core functionality of machine learning is actually around service, service orientation. So that actually really resonated with me because everything we do, we actually cater for the customer's needs. We cater for this influx of data that is coming in and trying to ensure that the product we have at the end of it actually caters for the, the people that we're actually giving this, this te technology towards at the end of the day. So yeah, that actually res resonated with me and I wanted to start off with that and just just based off the different steps that we have in what it is as women that we, we can actually bring to the table, this is a core functionality that we can actually bring towards the table. So apart from that, let me just address the elephant in the room. Why do we need machine learning? Why do we care about actually getting into data? What does it actually mean? Uh, so I'm sure a lot of you have heard this very often used term of data is the new oil, data is gold, data is everything. But what is, why do we have such, such need for data? Why do we have suddenly an influx in data? We have several social media platforms. We have so much different technology out there that is constantly gathering this data. And it's only the natural progression. Uh, we have our basic software engineering practices that used to previously take a system, cater for a specific input of data, and then we get an output. But now with the influx in data, it becomes even more difficult to start anticipating those patterns. And that's where machine learning comes into play because the core concept of machine learning is actually building dynamic algorithms that can modify themselves when exposed to new data sets. So what does that actually mean? So that means that we don't know what happens in the center of everything. We, the only thing we know is we have the input and we have the output. Now, whatever happens in between is machine learning. Whatever happens in between is actually data science, machine learning, AI, everything that that center part focuses on is actually what I actually try and take into production. So we have our data scientists that actually focus on exploring the data, ensuring that we have the correct um, insights being drawn out of it. We have our data analysts also doing that. But now where I come into play is actually ensuring that once these insights have been drawn out and once the data has been fully explored, we want to take it into production. There's no point in having these insights and all this knowledge that has been gathered in this data without actually getting it into a production environment and actually getting it into a into a format that can be consumed by the users and actually use it to its full, full, full potential. So that's kind of where I come in. And what actually is very core to this role is being able to say that um, we need to actually take this as a software project. As much as it is machine learning and it's in different realm, we can't forget our core concept of taking something into a software engineering good practices method methodology. So one of the core functionalities of my job is actually basic software engineering, uh, ensuring that whatever it is that we've actually isolated in that data, data science atmosphere and isolated in our data analyst atmosphere, can actually now be extracted and be pulled into a production environment. So often what I really like about my job is the fact that I actually get to collaborate. Once again, something that Zanila mentioned earlier is I get to collaborate with so many different minds and so many different paradigms in order to actually take this through the entire journey and take it into the consumer's hands, which is where the key is. So just to give you an example of how this process would potentially work like, I'm sure everyone has worked with Facebook before. Um, and what does Facebook have when they need to actually identify a person's face? They ask you to tag the person's face. Then eventually you tag the person's face over time, it's automatically, you automatically pick up the person's face. That is actually 
the exact example of what a machine learning engineer eventually can do with the insights that have been drawn out of the data science capacity. So taking that insights we've drawn out of the data science capacity, putting it in the person's hands, putting it in the customer's hands and allowing them to actually leverage off this cool functionality that we've actually built over time. So that is actually a pure example of one of the things we can actually do with machine learning and how a machine learning engineer actually facilitates that process. It's a lot more complex than just um, we have data, we need to pull out insights, but there's a afterthought of that because once you have been able to pull out the insights, then you actually need to take it into an environment in a sustainable manner. So this is actually one of the reasons why I'm an advocate for responsible AI because as much as we can say that artificial intelligence is the future, machine learning is the future, there's a right way of doing things. And if things aren't done in the correct way and in the appropriate manner, um, all of that has been built up and all the work that data scientists and data analysts and data engineers have done over time will become null and, null and void. And we can't actually utilize AI and machine learning to its full capacity. And that's the reason why it's important to have machine learning engineers around because if we don't have that person that constantly checks the process to see, is this being done in the correct way? Is this soft, best software engineering practices? Is this actually uh, how, we want to, how we want to interface with our customers in a secure manner? We need that person to actually be able to go throughout the entire journey and understand every single aspect of the journey, whether it be from the data engineering side, data science side, data analyst, or even just in the final dev DevOps stage. Um, that person needs to be able to take that sentiment throughout the journey uh, and ensure that every single part of that process is accurately followed and ensure that everything is actually done in the correct way. So one example of this is actually um, when you need to actually take a data product into a production environment, it requires so many different um, avenues that need to be facilitated. For example, you need to ensure that you have the correct testing mechanisms. You need to ensure that it is a scalable product. You need to ensure that uh, the correct people have access to the data. You, so there's so many aspects that need to be catered for. Um, so it becomes important as a machine learning engineer that has to has facilitate taking this product into production, that they understand what the data engineer is doing, uh, work in collaboration with these data engineers, see what sort of problems they've actually encountered in this process, and then creatively, once again, back to Zendile's point, uh, creatively sort of create a solution that can work for both the data engineer as well as the person that will be consuming the data the next step. And I kid you not, most of these steps are very creative because it is a very new in a very new space. And as much as uh, people have been in this space for a while, it's only now that people are starting to push those boundaries and actually take it to the next step. Um, and especially since machine learning on its own, it's very much you have an input data set, you have an output data set, and the in-between space is a creative space. It's a space that needs to be completely analyzed and you need to sort of find out what works and what doesn't work. And sometimes things don't work. And if they don't work, you need to ensure that you can actually go back. So you need to be able to work throughout the entire journey again, do a feedback, do a full circle, and then understand where, the, where it broke in the process and reevaluate your solution. So there is no clear cut way of doing it besides active collaboration and constant creative ways of thinking about a solution. So those are core concepts of actually becoming a machine learning engineer, being creative, being able to collaborate, uh, ensuring that you always have the customer's needs in the, in the front, of your, front of your mind at all times, ensuring that things are being done in the right way. Um, and all of this is a, it has nothing to do with whether you are a woman or man, it's very much if you can, if you have that sort of mindset, if you have that problem solving mindset, then you can actually just work throughout the process. So it's actually, um, if you're passionate about what you do, and if you truly understand and can work with the different people and are constantly willing to learn, um, constantly willing to learn from others and ensuring that the, the information that you are receiving from other people is actually utilized in the most constructive manner, then there's nothing stopping you from actually taking something into production in the most productive way. So I think one of the messages I'd like to actually 
tell everyone um, listening to this uh, listening to this uh, live stream is that it doesn't matter if you don't know where to begin. It doesn't matter whether you actually if you are the brightest in your class or if you actually uh, have 10 years of experience in this space. It really comes down to if you want to solve the problem and if you're passionate about actually solving the problem using machine learning or AI or trying to take something into, into a scalable environment and future-proofing a solution. If you're passionate about that, then it becomes easier to collaborate with people. It becomes easier to actually pick up on the skills that you need to pick up on. I mean, in my journey so far, I've had to learn so many different skills uh, because it really comes down to if you don't actually pick up on the skills as you need to pick up on the skills, then you won't really be able to take anything into the next step. So you need to have that constant hunger to learn. You need to constantly feel that you need to solve a problem. And if you have that, then there's actually nothing stopping you from going to the next step and actually taking something, making something successful. So I think that has actually been my journey so far. And that's the reason, one of the reasons why I'm so passionate about machine learning and AI is it's, it's actually, it's a future proofing way of solving problems, um, especially with our constant influx of data and the way things are moving so quickly, we need to actually dynamically do things. There's no, there's no reason in actually um, trying to do solve problems in the old way. It's time to be creative with our solutions. And um, if we're not creative with our solutions, we're not going to be able to solve problems in a more effective manner. Um, so yeah, that's that's basically it from me. Thanks, thanks for listening, everyone. I think uh, next probably we have Tanika coming on. Thank you so much, Archie, for sharing your journey as a machine learning engineer. I really believe that having a female that you resonate with can help inspire one so much. Thank you for leading by example in paving the way for future female machine learning engineers. And I'm sure our goal coders are, are inspired now more than ever. Okay, coming up next, uh, we're going to be going heading straight into our Q&A um, session. So please feel free to ask anything that you need to know. Okay. So our first question for the day is, um, does being certified increase chances of obtaining a junior data scientist without experience? So to make up, I'll talk that question. Um, I think it pertains mostly to the HR and recruitment side of things. I think um, the way in which the world is going, um, especially for, for developers and acquiring technologists, qualification is no longer as imperative, I think, as it used to be. What we're finding is that a lot of the competency is um, is is housed in people that have really taken upon themselves to personally upskill. So whether you have a degree or certification, I think that um, it speaks for uh, it speaks for itself in the sense that um, it's it's really up to you to upskill in your own capacity. So I wouldn't worry too much. Although of course they are very important, um, there are other ways um, going about entering into the profession without having a a formal qualification. But yes, certification always does help, um, and anything that you're able to do in your own kind of capacity is certainly advantageous. Can I add to that? I think certifications yeah. are a great way to keep score, right? And that's really what they are. They're a great way to say, well, we've got this much or look at what I've got. But certification isn't a guarantee of competence. And really what organizations are looking for is competence. Can you actually do the job? Right. And so if you can demonstrate in an interview that I've done this before and here's the project I worked on and these are the things that I had to do and the solutions I had to come up with and the pieces of technology I had to work with, that's a far better answer than just saying I have a certification. And so I agree. I don't think a, not having a certification should keep, hold you back at all. But I think you need to think about how do you demonstrate that you're competent, that you can actually do the work when um, you're required to do that. And that's far more important. And then, obviously, go and get the certification. 
hundred percent, hundred percent. Thank you so much, guys. So I think um, this coming question, um, Elmery actually just answered. Um, so someone is asking if they stand a chance of being a data scientist without a computer science degree in South Africa. Yeah, so I think when I, when I spoke earlier on, I said that actually there's a lot of crossover professions that we see. And um, certainly within synthesis, we see very often that people move from being application developers into this machine learning space or people who were previously um, software architects who now moving into um, data architecture as well. And so I don't think that that there's necessarily a barrier to that. But I do think that you need to think about the underlying skills that you need and the underlying competencies. But it doesn't just have to be a specific data science degree that's going to get you where you need to go. Thank you so much, Elmeri. Um, does anyone have any last words um, before I close? So yes, um, Tiniko, thank you so much for the opportunity to collaborate with Girl Code. Um, it's been such an honor and a privilege to have shared this platform with you guys. You do such amazing work in empowering the future, which is female. So from, from all of us at Synthesis, thank you so, so much. No, thank you from us at Girl Code as well. You know, the, the Synthesis partnership has been absolutely amazing. We have been absolutely honored to actually partner with women who share the same passion that we do. I mean, from the very first time I walked into a meeting with Sue Ann, um, who is the general manager, as well as Almeri, um, head of learning, um, the energy was just super amazing. And I did tell Zandile about this, and I was like, you know, I'm super excited um, to actually collaborate with Synthesis. I really hope it goes well. So, yeah. Uh, Zandile, do you have any final words? Yeah, I think this is um, how magic is created when we find the right partnerships with companies that absolutely believe in empowering women, right? So we're not saying that now this should become a woman-only space. Um, what we're saying is that over the past couple of years, we've only seen men take up the platform. So this is now our opportunity to say to young girls that this is this is you belong in the space you can be good at it and there's other women doing it so for me i think it's absolutely amazing always working with both women firstly um and seeing them not just talking the talk but actually like doing it um so it's been great and i think you know over the next couple of years with our goal coders and a lot now wanting to be in the space um this partnership will definitely enable them to explore more and get more insights um what will also do is once we share um, the information not just with the ones that are present today but with our whole you know community um see if there's more questions that we can filter through because i definitely think there's a lot of information and a lot of germs a um, lot of information out there and i think you know what i said is take up opportunity and i just want girls to stop being scared of asking questions of like saying i'm here i don't know everything but i want to be a part of it um so yeah it's it's you know it's it's we're making progress uh and i'm i'm excited to see what else we can do and how we can rope in more women great thank you thank you so much to our great panel of speakers today as well as all of our viewers for tuning in and i really hope the session was um very helpful to you and i hope also it inspired you to actually grow your journey and actually be find out more about being a data science scientist or get into machine learning. Have a good evening, everyone. Thanks. Bye.